First United Church. <coughs> Welcome to the First United Church of Christ. <coughs> Allergies are terrible. This is an exciting and marvelous Sunday. First of all, it's cool, so we can rejoice the fact that it's cool. Secondly, we have the opportunity to, to welcome a, a new child into the family of this church and, in fact, the family of, of God's church. And so we're, we rejoice for the fact that we have marvelous baptism today for, for Jackson Keith Arnold. Uh, we're thrilled to have the Arnold family with us. And, uh, the extended Arnold family with us, I should say, and we're glad to, to be here. Uh, Nancy Amor uh, gave an announcement to make, and that is following the service this morning, uh, we need some, some labor to help us carry the, the remaining boxes of the rubber sale outside to cover them for the tarp so they can be picked up by the, the group that is taking up our exits. So if you're able to give us 15 minutes, I should think it should take absolutely no longer than that. So thank you very much. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? Then if we have none, would you please stand for our call to worship? God is waiting for us. God is ready for us. God is blessing us. And God is sending us. God is here. Let it begin with that marvelous hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Oh, I'm sorry. Whatever it is, rejoice with your heart. I've got it written down along my, my service. <laughs> Thank you. 
Listen to the still speaking of God. And like the people of Jerusalem long ago, we misunderstand the Spirit's movement among us. In the silence and stillness of this moment, let us draw near to God and listen to His particular message for us. Let us confess our sin together. God, you know that we have sinned. You know that we have hurt each other, been unkind, and thought only of ourselves. You have given us such grace and mercy. Help us to extend the same to our brothers and sisters. Free us from holding grudges, from gossip, and from passing judgment. Let us never pour shame upon another, but instead love and peace. Help us walk with each other toward forgiveness and restoration. Thank you for the beauty you will bring to our relationships because we have sought your healing. We are yours, gracious God. Amen. Friends, in this we have the assurance of God's forgiveness. While we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Because we have received God's mercy, we are free to grant mercy to those who have wronged us. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. They were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, Jesus was indignant. And he said to them, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the realm of God like a child shall not enter it. And Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them and laid his hands upon them. May we read responsibly for the golden answer. As we come to this font of living water, let us recall the meaning of baptism. Jesus said, unless we are born of you, we cannot see the reign of God. Unless we are born of water and the Spirit, we cannot enter God's new order. Through baptism, we join in the death and resurrection of Jesus, releasing the ways of the world and beginning a new life in Christ. A new life of the image of God in all being. Together in the spirit, we are the body of Christ. Can I ask the family to come forward to the baptism? So I address the parents. You desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ, and so answer, we do. We do. You guys can answer too. We encourage your child to renounce the powers of evil and receive a new life in Christ. If so, we answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. You teach your child that he may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If so, answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. And do you promise? 
by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, to witness the work and word of Jesus as best as you are able to such answer we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. And you promise, according to the grace given you, to grow with your child in the Christian faith, to help him be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian church that Jackson may grow and refer his baptism. And so we answer, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. And then to the congregation. <clears throat> Jesus Christ calls us to make disciples of all nations, to offer them the gift of the grace of baptism. To you who witness and celebrate this sacrament, promise your love and support and care to the one baptized as he lives and grows in Christ, we so respond with a bold answer. We are called through the Gospels and by the Spirit to live in the way of Christ, to spread the word of God, to baptize those who seek grace and transformation. With Christians in all places and time, we stand to witness and celebrate the baptism of Jackson Keith Arnold, Promise our love, support, care, and blessing to him as he lives and grows in Christ. We bow our heads in prayer. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation, called forth by your saving word. Before the world had shape and form, your, your spirit moved over the waters. Out of the waters of the deep, you formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with waters of the flood, and your ark of salvation bore a new beginning. In the time of Moses, your people of Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the Promised Land. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan. He became a living water to a woman in the Samaritan well. He washed the feet of disciples and sent them forth to baptize all nations by the water of the Holy Spirit. So today, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless by your Holy Spirit this water, by your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Christ, that sin may have no power over them. Create new life in the one baptized this day, that he may rise in Christ. Glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and is and shall be, world without end. Amen. So by what name shall he be called? Jackson Keith Arnold has baptized you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because of uh, concerns about COVID, we're simply going to hold Jackson up so you may all see him. And we'll sing together the first two verses of the community of the baptismal hymn that's in your bowl. God, you have filled the world with joy by giving us this gift of Jesus. Bless Jackson, this newly baptized child, a member of our household of faith. May he be filled with joy, and may he never be ashamed to confess a personal faith in you. Bless the parents of Jackson that they may always show their gratitude for the life you have given by loving and caring for Jackson. Bless these faithful people. Unite them in peace in the peace of Christ and the company of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May you go in the peace of Christ, and thanks be to God.
As we turn to God's word for illumination today, let us pray together a prayer for illumination. Holy and good creator, we rejoice that you are a God who communicates. Thus the one who wrote upon the tablets of stone is the same one who writes the divine word upon our hearts and minds. Prepare us now, we pray, to hear, receive, and obey your word as the scripture is read and proclaimed. May it penetrate deeply and move us to respond to your spirit. Amen. We continue to make our way through the Hebrew scriptures, and today we read from 1 Kings. We've been reading about David, and now we turn to Solomon and his son. Then David rested, rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He reigned 40 years over Israel, 70 years in Hebron, and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given to him by his father, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense for the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered 1,000 burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask whatever you want of me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, my Lord God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this, and so God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for a long life or wealth or anything else for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administrative justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise, discerning heart so that there will, be, so that there will never have anyone like you, nor will ever ever be like you in the future. Moreover, I give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that your lifetime will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commandments as David your father did, I will give you long life. We continue in the New Testament, we read once again from the uh, epistle of Paul to the Ephesian church. And you can tell by the tenor of, the, of this note that indeed the church was having some difficulty, some difficulty in relationships. It relates to our confession of sin this morning. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise but wise, making the use of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we continue to read this morning from the Gospel of John, from the sixth chapter. Some of these words are familiar because we've read them a couple of times, but they are integral to the Christian faith. Jesus is speaking to the crowd and to his disciples. I am the living Lord who came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh which I give to you for the life of the world. And the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, there will be no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will rise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And he said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Then we continue on. 
on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, and who can accept it? Where the disciples were grumbling about this, the Lord said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave me, do you? Jesus said to the twelve. And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who was one of the twelve who would later betray him. He includes our word, reading from God's holy word. May he add his blessing to our reading. Let us turn our attention to Sheila for special use of this morning.
you know, thanks for always going the extra mile and always practicing so hard and always providing us with marvelous music. We really do appreciate your ministry in this congregation. Have you ever noticed that it's really very, very difficult to escape your reputation? You know, once people have an image of you in their minds, it's really very difficult to, to change their perception. And it struck me, I was thinking about a commercial that was very popular in the 1940s, before my time, certainly. Maybe not too much before my time, but before my time. There was a highly popular advertising jingle for, for Chiquita Bananas. It ended with this line. Bananas like the climate of very, very tropical, of the very, very tropical equator. So you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. No, 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 no. The only reason that the word refrigerator was in that jingle was because it rhymed with equator. And they wanted to be very sure that people knew that bananas came all the way from, from hot and distant Central America. Uh, the company wanted to remind bananas that, that they were unique in a very, very important part of the diet. And the truth was, then and still is now, that bananas do much, much better in the refrigerator than they do outside of the refrigerator. They last longer, they taste better, they have a much longer shelf capacity. But in the 1940s, if you remember, I remember the first refrigerator that I saw as a kid in our apartment in New York City, the freezer couldn't be much more than about this big. When we got the bigger refrigerator, it probably said the door sat about this big, it was about this high, so you had no room. Remember my mom was going to the grocery store three or four times a week to, to buy the groceries. And uh, there simply was no room in the refrigerator for, uh, for bananas. But the, the jingle became remarkably popular. It was found in, in jukeboxes, if you can believe that. The US government uh, took that jingle and modified it during the Second World War to encourage people to conserve water. It was the perfect ad. But it really began to cost the company a, a lot of money. Because right after the Second World War, the suburbs exploded. And people moved out of the suburbs. And they got bigger houses. And one of the, one of the things they learned in their, their kitchen was what? A bigger refrigerator. We continue that quest all the time, don't we? And so the trip to the grocery store was, was a once a week kind of kind of trip. And when you went, you bought maybe a dozen oranges and a dozen apples, but you sure didn't buy a dozen bananas. Because bananas don't do well in the refrigerator and they'll spoil if you put them there, so you'd still buy three bananas. And Chiquita tried for years to, to turn that, that reputation around, but they simply couldn't do it. So once people have an image of us, an image of a product in their minds, it's very, very difficult to, to change it. I remember watching the Jack Benny show with, with my folks. And Jack Benny, remember, was a remarkably generous person in real life, but he cultivated an image of being an incredible type one. And he wanted to keep that image going even in public because it gave him a great opportunity to be funny and, and have a good time. One day, the story is he was having lunch with Edgar Bergen of Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy fame and they were in the Brown Derby in Hollywood. And Benny demanded the check. The waiter feigned surprise and said, Mr. Benny, I'm surprised to hear you ask for the check. So am I, said Benny. That's the time I ever read the bank for question. You know, once people think they've got you figured out, it is difficult to, to change their perception. And we see that Jesus ran into this a couple times in the Gospels. He lived in a small town in a remarkably small country. There weren't many people there, and people knew it. They, they knew his mom and dad. They might have known him in his role as a carpenter, because he spent 30 years as a carpenter before he began his ministry. <clears throat> he probably built something for them, repaired some, some product for them. So they knew who he was. And can you imagine how, how people felt when, when suddenly this guy proclaimed himself to be the one that had been had been prophesied about by the prophets. You know, we read in, in today's lesson that, that his fellow countrymen began to grumble about him. He said he was the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, just as we would say, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his mom and dad. You know, we kind of appreciate that, that perception they had of him, this, this dip, disbelief they had about him. You know, and we do the same thing for people all the time. We put them in a box. We assign them to, to a category. We know where they came from. We know who their parents are. We, we know where they went to school. We can tell by their accent or their appearance or, or their background. And you know, the brain makes, makes certain assumptions. Because when we make those assumptions, we, we begin to treat them in, in a certain way. You know, if you're a teacher you know, and you know that family's always been a problem, then you suddenly treat them a little bit different when you see them in the classroom. If you're a police officer and you, you know that High anxiety that comes when you're doing the traffic stop and so on, then you approach a certain car a little bit differently than the other ones. 
Maybe if you're the HR person in the company and you're looking at folks to promote, maybe you look at that new candidate a little bit differently because of the box you may have put them in. You know, that's intention. I don't think we're even conscious of it so many times. It's simply that, that it saves our brain time, it saves our brain energy from sorting out all these, these people we know individually. And so we sort it out by category. I know who you are, Jesus. You're Mary Ann and Joseph's kid. You're from Nashville. You know, it's a small farming town, isn't it? Maybe we should get you a job that's not too taxing mentally because we know the schools are, are really pretty slow up there. But if you don't think those kinds of things happen every single day, you know, then, then, then you're mistaken because that's exactly the way we, we deal with people. That's the way our brains operate. Our brains operate in the laziest possible way. We make connections instantaneously because that's easier for us. And the message from the gospel is that we need to be careful when we judge somebody else's potential. Anytime you write somebody off without giving them a fair shot, whatever that situation is, you, you may be mistaken. You may have done yourself a disservice, you may have done them a disservice. Robert Schuller once asked one of his, uh, his good friends, uh, what's the most, the most vivid memory you have of being early on in your school career? And this is what his colleague told him. In the third grade, you were asked to stand up in front of the class and, and say what we wanted to be when we grew up. And when, and my school was really pretty strict, and so when you stood up in class, you took it very, very seriously. He said, I remember distinctly that one little girl stood up and, and said, I'm going to be a movie star. As I think about her, she wasn't very pretty. Never thought she was particularly bright. Her grades weren't all that good. She didn't come from a wealthy family. In fact, the only thing I really remember about her was the class laughed at her. Everybody laughed at her, and she just stood there smiling as if she knew something the rest of us didn't know. Well, to say, I don't remember ever seeing that girl in, in school again. Now I see her all the time. She's one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. Every time I sit in the movie theater and watch her up there on the silver screen, I think she was always so proud of who she was. She had a dream that she always held on to. So back then they laughed at her. Now they pay to see her. I'm glad I didn't laugh. When I said who she is, but she'll never fill in that, that bottom line. But they laughed at Jesus. Who is this girl? The bread of heaven? We know where you're from. You're Mary and Joseph's kid. Be careful how you judge people. You know, we need to be very, very careful with the stuff I see on, on social media today. We need to be careful when we, when we place people in, in a certain kind of box and put them in a, in a particular kind of group. We don't care if they're long hairs or, or short hairs or no hairs or gray hairs or minorities, or ethnics, or, or yuppies, or pixers, or white, brown, color. As people are straight or gay. We have all kinds of boxes in which we love to, to categorize people. There's so many other really more important factors that determine the person's success. Intelligence, talent, determination, desire, hard work. They're the external characteristics that are so much more important. The external characteristics are so much less important than the internal ones that drive us for success. 150 years ago, more, more uh, people put a list of that black walk in a box. And the box was labeled woman. Elizabeth had a dream back then when dreams for women were really pretty circumscribed. Dreams were fine as long as they weren't held by, by women. Elizabeth Blackwell had a lot of determination and a lot of gumption, and she really didn't care what people thought. So she set out to realize her dream of becoming a doctor. She applied to eight medical schools. It was rejected publicly. One school, the, the Geneva Medical School in New York, finally accepted her. Elizabeth didn't know that the professors had admitted her because they thought it would be great to see a woman come there and fail. They thought it would be really kind of funny to, to watch her come out of the bottom of the class. They asked the students, and the students said, sure, admit her. That would be fun. Well, the only person laughing at the end of the graduation was Elizabeth, who was number one in the class. So she traveled to Europe and she uh, attended some of the finest medical schools there. And when she came to the state, she thought she might get a job in practice, and not a single practice was willing to offer her a job. So she decided to open her own clinic in a slum neighborhood in New York City. And she got harassed all the time, but she kept that clinic going. She was taking care of the poor and the immigrants and the people at the bottom of the society. And then when the Civil War came up, uh, she began training nurses for the battlefield. She trained scores and not hundreds of women for the battlefield. She, sent them forth in the lines to nurse the wounded and, and to save lives. By the end of the war, surprising things happened. Women were no, nurses were, were an institution in American society. 
Nobody gave them a second thought any longer. The Black Girls Legions of Women Nurses gained the social acceptance that she had worked so hard to obtain. In 1868, she was able to open her own medical school for women. She spent her last years in London uh, training women and nurses and doctors. Thanks to, to her efforts, to her dreams, the barriers of prejudice came down and women were accepted in the, in the medical field. Kathleen and I were talking to our internist on Charlotte not too long ago, asking him about the difference in medical school today compared to when he first came to the States. And he said, you know, today it's a, it used to be 90% men. Today he says 65% women. You know, the dream of Melissa Blackwell has come true because of the termination. Now, I think that's a story that can be told time and time and time again. We do people great disservice when we limit what they might be able to offer to society because of a color, color or an accent or a gender or some service characteristic. What counts is, is what's in their heart. And that's where Jesus really comes into play. With Christ's help, we can be all can be a lot more of them than, than we ever dreamed. It doesn't make any difference where we come from or, or how we look or how we talk or who our parents are or what school we went to or how much money we live. We're all children of the same time. We all have more potential than we ever conceivably could uh, take advantage of our results. I think Jesus is the one who can help us so orient our lives that we can overcome obstacles. He said he is the bread of the world. When we feed on him, we're able to accomplish more than we ever dreamed possible. Casey Bailey, as a young man, stood before the judge with his head <clears throat> high, his jaw set defiantly, and he was really defiant against the sentence the judge was about to impose upon him. <clears throat> the words of his high school wrestling coach echoed in his mind, don't ever hang your head. Don't ever admit defeat. Tracy said he wouldn't hang his head, he wouldn't admit defeat, not before his ashamed parents and broken-hearted parents, not before a shocked community, not before the judge, not before God. No one would see this pain. The citizens of Goshen, Indiana had been stunned to learn that Tracy Bailey, the captain of the high school wrestling team, a member of student council, a good student, his family went to church. How could he be one who was involved in the devastating vandalism of the local high school? Well, he'd fallen into a, you know, and it's predictable, he'd fallen into a, into a bad group of kids. They, they were drinking alcohol, they, they got, you know, his friends here on the alcohol, and they broke into the high school, they tore apart a couple classrooms. And this judge decided he was going to hold this crew of kids to account. He didn't want any other civil mayhem going on in his community, so Tracy was sentenced to a five year term in a, in a juvenile offenders facility. You know, like, in most cases, these things were originally thought of as being a, a lesser form of penitentiary, but they never were. They held hardened criminals and murderers and rapists. There wasn't going to be a slap on the wrist for this kid. In the prison, Tracy carried the same image. He was going to bend an inch. He was going to be tough. He'd never, he'd never admit defeat. He'd never admit that he was hurting. But he said during a stint in solitary confinement, he, he happened to uh, catch a sight of himself in the mirror. He said the sight shocked him. He didn't just look hard. He said, I looked dead. He said, I knew this deadness would reach down into the very depths of my soul. He said, all my toughness melted away, and tears began to flow, and I began to pray to God. And I realized I couldn't rely on my own reserves anymore. I said, I don't know how long I prayed. But I knew they were God heard me. So one of the guards approached him and offered him a Bible. And some offered him a prayer, partly some offered him a Gideon Bible, and he joined the prison Bible study. When he was released from the center, Tracy worked hard for several months just to pay off the debts, to make restitution to the school. He entered college. He decided he was going to go into education. He, uh, got an education degree in, in math and science. He decided to pay back society and become a good role model for other troubled kids. He would become a teacher. You've probably heard of Tracy Bell. Uh, he reached his goal. In uh, 1993, he attended a special ceremony at the White House where he was awarded the President's Award for the National Teacher of the Year. So look at our congregation. We all have dreams of one kind or another. Some of our dreams we've had for a long time. Some of us feel we're approaching a, a latter portion of our lives, but we have to dream our dreams. We, we can't think about the strikes that may be against us. You know, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm female, I'm too old. Uh, my high school wasn't the best high school. My parents didn't have money. I don't have very much money. 
I don't have all the advantages that some other people have. I'm getting older and more tired. I don't think we have to think about the obstacles that we have to overcome. Because we know in this congregation that God can help us overcome almost any obstacle. Who would have thought that, uh, look at Father Dory, who would have thought that two and a half years ago we embarked upon a campaign to restore the steeple of this church and raise the money and pay the bill? It was a pretty steep obstacle that we've overcome. We overcome a lot of obstacles in our history. People in this congregation have overcome a lot of obstacles in their lives. So don't think about what we can't do. We only have to think about what, what we can do. You know, if that man from the tiny little town of Nazareth uh, is with us, then I understand most of his adult life as, as a carpenter, the man who was laughed at because of who his mom and dad were. That man raised with a father in glory. You know, that fellow still can take us out on a great adventure as individuals and as family members and as new children and as a congregation. There's a great adventure opening for us. I think we just have to make the same mistake that we have sometimes made in our lives and other people have made about us. Of judging the opportunities based upon our past experience, of judging the opportunities based upon outward characteristics that have nothing to do with the heart of the people who sit in this congregation of Sunday morning. Amen. Can you please stand and let us affirm our faith together? We believe in God, whose love for us is sure, steadfast, and unconditional. We believe in Jesus Christ, who came that we might know what a life of love looks like, and who assured us that where two or three gather in his name, there also is he. We believe in the Holy Spirit, which sustains us in times of trouble and nudges us to rise to our greater selves. We believe in hope, which triumphs over despair, and in the grace of God, which will lead us home. Amen. Let us sing together our next hymn of worship. sound of children in church. Which absolutely. Think about the words of Jesus that the little children come to me. Look, it's more important than the kids. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We ask a blessing upon us. We give we rejoice in the marvelous new life of Jackson Arnold. We give you thanks for the marvelous blessings that this family has together and the witness this family makes in our congregation. We ask that, indeed, you might inspire dreams for us, dreams as family members, dreams of members of this community, dreams of members of this household of faith, and that we might find ways to rely upon you as we look for hope and direction and courage and faith and strength. Father, today we ask your blessing upon all of us. We remember particularly Patty Smith, we think particularly of, of the people in, in Haiti today, and for the people of our country who are suffering, we ask your blessing upon them that they might find healing and strength and courage. And as witnessing Christians, we might find ways to reach out to them and to help them. All these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory for heaven. Amen. Would you please stand for our prayer of dedication, followed by the doxology. <clears throat> Gracious God, you have showered us with your gifts, and we embrace you with thanksgiving. They are embracing arms wide open, ready to share, to serve, and to love. Use our spiritual gifts that we may live the spiritual life, moving according to the Spirit's heated touch and bending in the direction of God's holy will. <laughs> As we go forth, may we sense God's great spirit going with us. As we go forth, may we take the good news to the poor, the lonely, those in prison and those in nursing homes, those who are discouraged, and those who need a smile and touch of love and affirmation. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. 